followed the just concluded presidential election must have seen that the major reason Donald Trump won is his consistent vow to protect American manufacturing and jobs against China and Mexico. On the 11th of June 2011, taxi drivers across major European cities, from Madrid to Milan, and from London to Paris, tagged, staged, coordinated, and highly disruptive demonstrations against the new, less costly, and more efficient American taxi company called Uber, a service that uses a smartphone app to get users' taxis from the comfort of their location. In London, for example, over 5,000 taxi drivers blockaded the city center in a protest with the flimsiest excuse that Uber's drivers lack the knowledge of London's streets. More worryingly, the otherwise progressive mayor of London supported the protesting drivers and suggested that Uber drivers could be made to pass language and geography tests. For almost a decade now, Indian retailers, India with citizens and businessmen everywhere, have been waging a war against their government's proposal to open up the retail sector to more efficient global players like Walmart. In fact, on the 20th of September 2012, neighborhood shopkeepers across India went on strike and took to the streets to protest the government's decision to allow in foreign retailers. Most of them blocked major roads and climbed on trains demanding that the government rescind its decision. And here at home, variants of this policy were used to achieve significant sufficiency in cement, a product whose importation could have been costing Nigeria over $3.2 billion in FX reserves annually. In effect, therefore, this policy needs to be supported not just in response to the pressure on the Naira, but as an opportunity to change the economy's structure resuscitate local manufacturing, and expand job creation for our citizens. Take rice imports, for instance. Why should we keep allocating scarce effects to rice importers when vast amounts of paddy rice of comparable, in fact, better quality produced by poor, hardworking local farmers across the rice belts of Nigeria are wasted and farmers are falling deeper into poverty while we export their jobs and income to rice producing countries abroad. Few decades ago, Nigeria was one of the world's largest producers of palm oil, but today we import nearly 600,000 metric tons, while Indonesia and Malaysia combine to export over 90% of global demand. Under these circumstances, I believe it is appropriate and in fact expected that the CPN contributes its, contribute to protecting the jobs and income of local farmers using some, some of the same principles Western economies use to justify the protection of their farmers through huge subsidies. Implications of a changing world. You will all agree with me that recently there were two major unexpected outcomes in two countries that are clearly globally dominant, but econo both economically and militarily. These countries are also strong supporters of free trade and globalization. The first was Brexit vote, while the second is the outcome of the recently concluded elections in the United States. These two events and the trends of public discourse raging in France, Italy, and Germany are bound to change or alter trade policies and international economic cooperation between the countries and the world at large. Two very key issues in the British referendum 
and the United States elections were immigration and economy, particularly free trade. The outcomes of the referendum and elections centered around the desire of the citizens to take back their sovereignty, which they believe had been concessioned away by their past leaders. As for the United States election, the president-elect promised to be tough on immigration and to protect U.S. industries, to ensure that U.S. jobs are no longer exported to other countries, while for those industries that had left the United States, they would be given incentives and encouraged to return in the industries back to the United States. The main issue for us as a country is to examine the implications of these actions on not only free trade and dumping in emerging and frontier markets, but also on the entire world order. For Nigeria, the question is, how prepared are we to shield our team in masses and our country to manage the ultimate fallout? Let me state that there must, that we must critically analyze the implications of the anticipated changes and prepare strategies as to the best ways to tap into the opportunities that may be thrown up or minimize the challenges that may arise therefrom. Carbon inflation. In order to tackle inflation, we must first understand what kind of inflation we have in Nigeria. Is it demand pull with too much money chasing few goods or cost push where supply constraints result in few goods in the marketplace? Our analysis at the CBN suggests that we have cost food push inflation in Nigeria. Indeed, we currently have several, several supply constraints that can be christened three problematic Fs. Food, low harvest, disease, out, disease outbreak, northeast crisis, fuels, high electricity, PMS, and kerosene prices, foreign exchange, high demand, and low supply of foreign exchange. Given this analysis, it is easy to see why the CBN is doing a lot to ease these supply constraints. In response to recent calls by notable persons and groups on the central mark of Nigeria to reduce the country's high lending rates, I think it is important that I share my views on this issue. Let me first state that I have long been a believer in low interest rates. In fact, when I unveiled my vision for the CBN on assumption of office on June in June 2014, reducing interest rates was one of my cardinal missions. Yet, it is important that we discuss this issue based on facts rather than politics and or emotions. First, interest rate is a veritable tool for curtailing inflation with inflation at over 18%. The CBN will be abjectly failing on one of its cardinal objectives if it cuts interest rates at this time. Second, for those who say we need a rate cut to spur growth, we need to remind ourselves that high inflation is highly inimical to economic growth. Indeed, many empirical studies have estimated the threshold level at which inflation becomes significantly growth retarding to be 11% for developing economies. With our inflation at 18.3%, one must question the judgment of cutting interest rates at this time. Finally, I think it is important to underscore that interest rates reflect not just the cost of capital, but also the cost of doing business. And so we need to also look at interest rates from the perspective of the lender. Given that most banks have to individually provide security, power, 
and other infrastructure, it is not surprising that some of these costs are passed on to customers in the form of high interest rates. But notwithstanding these facts, we will continue to use moral suasion to encourage our deposit money banks to be more considerate in interest rate charges to their customers. Let me note at this juncture that one of the reasons the central bank ventured into development banking was to minimize the effect of high interest rates on customers. This push started in 1977 with the Agricultural Credit Guarantee Scheme, and since then the CBN has intervened through various developmental programs, all at single-digit interest rates. To date, the CBN has disbursed over 393 billion naira in 490 projects under the Commercial Agricultural Credit Scheme. The CBN has also disbursed 23 billion naira under the Anchor Borrowers Program. 79.8 billion out of its 220 billion under the micro, small, and medium enterprise scheme, and 236.4 billion under the power and aviation intervention fund. Combined, these schemes have created over 6.7 million direct jobs and a lot more indirect jobs. Strong policy coordination. Finally, in times like this, there is usually the need for strong policy coordination between the key aspects of economic policy making space. In Nigeria, this would include fiscal monetary exchange and trade policies, which must be targeted at protecting our farmers and companies and industries that are committing resources to support government's drive to diversify the economy away from oil and fossil fuels. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not unaware of the short-term pains we are all going through right now, but I urge you all to use this as an opportunity for us to look inwards, diversify our economy, produce locally, and create jobs for our unemployed youths. We are resilient and hardworking people. Since gold only glitters after it has gone through enormous heat, I am confident that out of these difficulties would come our very best ideas and decisions. We definitely cannot survive as a people by importing everything and anything. Even when we disagree about the way forward, we need to treat each other with respect and fairness. We cannot keep suspecting one another and impugning motives for people's actions. Thank you.